Okay, so let's look at um, a core computational thinking skill, and that thinking skill is called abstraction. If we consider the, the word abstraction here, this can have three different meanings. Three different meanings. The word abstraction can be used to represent a process, such as um, I abstract detail, it's something that I do, okay? It can be used to represent a technique, technique. So a process or a technique, a technique like I use abstraction, I use abstraction. And thirdly, it can be used to represent an entity. Now an entity is a fancy word for a thing, generally a thing about which we're interested. Um, so in context that this is the abstraction that I have produced. So let's look at where we might have seen this before. I bet you've, you've heard the word abstraction used before and I would imagine that this is the context you've heard it in. This is a quote from a website, um, I believe, called um, Art Factory. And it's about a famous artist called Pablo Picasso. In about 1945, Pablo Picasso created a suite of 11 lithographs um, that have become a masterclass in how to develop artwork from the academic to the abstract. So there's the word abstract. Okay, what Picasso was trying to do in this situation was to try and, and distill essence, the absolute spirit of uh, the beast, as he called it, or a bull. Now, what I've done is I've uh, plagiarised, um, shamelessly plagiarised Pablo Picasso's bulls and created my own version of it, which is clearly much better. Um, a lot of detail in there. It looks like a bull. At the end of the day, um, it, contains, it contains characteristics that aren't necessarily required to define it as such. And what Picasso did is he said, right, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at all the features in this bolt and I'm going to abstract or take away or remove detail, remove characteristics from this bull to leave the essence, the spirit of the beast. And he was left with this at the end, which contains three uh, identifying features of the bull, the, the tail, the horns and the genitals. OK, so that's one situation where we may have heard it. Oh, you know, by the way, we'd call this, we would we would actually call this an, an abstraction or an abstract bull. OK, so an abstraction of a bull. It's an abstract bull. I've used abstraction. Um, I have abstracted detail. So there's the use of the word in, in the three different contexts. Right. I bet you any money you've uh, seen this example as well. OK, so in about... 1930, well, it was, it was in 1931, a, um, a draftsman uh, called Harry Beck, or Henry Charles Beck was his full name. He was working for the London uh, Underground Signals Office. And in his spare time, because he was that kind of guy, he thought, you know what, there's got to be a better way of representing this complex map of the London Underground system so that people find it easier to use. Because, you know, when I'm in a rush on the underground, I can't make any tale of this. So he designed this. Um, he was quite interested in electrical circuits as well, so it does bear some relationship to that also. And what Harry Beck did, it was he again distilled he um he 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 pulled out the vital parts of this system uh, the, basically the colors of the lines the 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 order the stations were visited in not necessarily their absolute positions either because you'll notice all the stations are the same distance apart and they're not in real life plus he also contextualized it a tiny bit by putting the um, the river thames in but again you'll notice that the river thames is quite abstract in nature uh, th this is still in use today and, and it's it's one of the you know the clusters one of the the, the best the, the high points of design uh, used all around the world in different underground systems as well so what again what harry beck did is he looked at a complex problem he looked at the map of london and all the underground stations and said let's get rid of all the stuff that we don't need let's let's just remove all the extraneous detail all the necessary detail and i'm left with the essence of the problem okay just the focused part of the problem that's required Right, let's look at a situation that we may come across which is a little bit more sort of focused on computer programming and computer science. So what I've done here is I've, I've chosen two people and I've gathered together some characteristics of those people. Um, and in essence, these characteristics here are individual, they're required, I suppose, in the general sense to identify these people. But if I look at I look at different scenarios, particular scenarios that these people might require their data to be used in, some of these characteristics are unnecessary, superfluous, extra to requirements. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to go through three scenarios. First of all, so these these three people might have a bank account. So in the context of a bank. These two people may well, um, and I hope they do, be registered at a local doctor. 
And these two people may well be uh, invited to some parties because they're that, those kind of people that go to parties. <laughs> Not that there's any, you know, anything wrong with that. Now, in these three contexts, it may not be necessary to use all of these characteristics. Uh, in other words, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select suitable characteristics, but the, the, the flip side of that is I'm going to abstract or take away unnecessary characteristics. So, for instance, the bank will definitely need to know the person's name and their address and their contact number, would not need to know any of these, definitely need to know the date of birth. So that's all the bank needs. So I generate for the bank an abstract model of this person, of these two people, where the NHS number height dietary requirements allergies do not exist. Okay, it's an abstract, a simpler model of the person. Okay, it makes it makes the life of the bank a lot easier. The doctor, for instance, and the doctor's an interesting one, because the doctor will have a very personal view of these people, okay? And therefore, there will be less abstraction occurring here. There will be a, a higher level model of that person, a higher level abstraction of the person. So the doctor would need the name, the address, the contact number, NHS number, absolutely height. Probably not dietary requirements, because that, you know, maybe, maybe not. I'll say not in this case. Allergies, definitely date of birth definitely so there's a different abstract model now the pink abstract model that the doctor needs of these people it's a different model than the bank needs because the bank can abstract away the unnecessary details from here the doctor less abstraction occurring because the doctor's only removing just the dietary requirements party organizer all they're going to need modern age name contact number imagine probably dietary requirements you know vegetarian vegan whatever probably allergies because we don't leave peanuts lying around so again, the party organiser will have a different abstract model of the person, a different abstract model of the person which is suitable for them. Now, you may notice, and I hope you do notice, if you look carefully here, that there's two of the characteristics of these two people that are common to all four situations. So let's just draw a box around here and here. Okay, so the name and the contact number are common. What this allows us to do, in fact, this is very clever, it allows us to design an abstract person. So let's let's say, you know, you could imagine it being not a real person, just like Picasso's abstract bull is not a real bull. It's an abstract person. So it gives the base model of a person onto which we can either just use it as it is, if it's enough, or it allows us to bowl extra characteristics on if necessary. This introduces you, and I'm not going to go much further on this, to a to a, a different method of programming called object-oriented programming. So object-oriented programming is a very natural way of, of, of writing computer software, which you'll you'll come across hopefully if you carry on your studies in computer science. Um, it's that oop, it's pronounced object-oriented programming, and the way that object-oriented programming works in a nutshell is you design entities, okay, or objects, things, which have a set of characteristics which are suitable for a particular scenario and those objects can interact with each other. So there might be a bank object that you create, uh, a customer object, uh, a cash machine object, and each of those has a particular set of characteristics. But to keep things simple, to keep things easy to manage, easy problems to solve, we take away all the unnecessary detail from those models, strip them down, par them back, so that I've got exactly the minimum that I need. Now, let's look at a scenario which is even closer to um, to uh, sort of computer programming. So I've, uh, I'm have i going to draw a little picture of myself. So I've got four friends, that's all I've got, just four friends. Okay, so I'm going to draw these. I'll draw myself, let's draw myself here. So here I am. There's me, there's my beard. There's my moustache and my face, and there's my oh, two eyes. I haven't got a nose. Leave that off. It's not necessary, my nose. Don't need to smell any. I've abstracted my nose away. Uh, and there we go. See, this is an abstract model of me, because I can recognise it as me, but it's not got all the features of me. It's good enough. It's quick enough. It does the job. You know, that's kind of what abstraction does. Okay, so I've got four friends, and those friends have made requests to me. And those questions, and they've made my first friend up here. My first friend is a civil engineer. And what he's done is he said, uh, Mark, can you um, can you can you write a computer program for me that will that will calculate the maximum will work out the maximum height of all the all the vehicles travelling on a particular road because he wants to build a bridge. He doesn't want to build a bridge that's too high. My second friend says, Mark, um, can you um, can you write a computer program which will, uh, will will work out the maximum diameter of cable that this particular shop sells? So because I'm a I'm an electrician and um, and I, I want want to buy a set of drills. I don't want the drills to be too big so that my cables aren't too floppy. But another friend who um, who works in um, uh, she produces um, 
chlorine tablets for domestic pools, okay? And she wants to know, she says, Mark, what is the maximum volume of domestic, which is very posh, maximum volume of domestic pools um, on sale in the UK? Because we don't want to, you know, produce. And my last friend, it works in retail. Oh, Mark, oh, Mark. Uh, can you tell me the maximum age of all the customers visiting the store in, in the last six month period? Uh, because he wants to do some market research. Now, th th what seemingly, these seemingly look like different scenarios, okay? But w if, if I abstract away, if I, this is an interesting implication of abstract, if I abstract away the context from here, and you should see this, hopefully if you look carefully at these four situations, you'll see the common feature. You'll find that there's a common feature, maximum, maximum height of vehicles, maximum down to kills, maximum volume of plants, maximum age of customers. So basically, if I abstract away the context, this is another interesting application of abstraction, I'm just left with numbers. That's all they are. Contextless numbers. What this does is it allows me to perform an abstract calculation. The abstract calculation takes a series of numbers, doesn't matter what they are, they're just a series of numbers, and it generates the maximum value in the set. So a maximum value, okay, in a set. What this allows me to do is to use one solution, and this is again where abstraction comes in use, because once I start to strip out the context, I thought, oh, hang on, I've seen this before somewhere. This is just a maximum number calculation. I've got one of those, I can do that. It's like, oh, I've got to write a new program about vehicles. You don't have to. What this does is it allows one solution to many problems. One solution to many problems. So look carefully. What I've done is I've taken away or abstracted the detail from the four separate problems that I had, and I've therefore produced a uh, a common theme. I've, I've identified a common theme, written a solution, done. Okay, right. So in summary, let's try and summarise where we are with this one. Hopefully, anyway. In summary, let's talk about abstraction and, and what it means, and and hopefully let's let's um, let's get to a point where we're we're comfortable with the concepts of it, and then we can put it into practice at, at, at some later stage. So abstraction. Okay, there's six things I want to talk to you about abstraction. Abstraction hides unnecessary detail, right? Hides unnecessary detail. But remember that this is contextual. So hides unnecessary detail. Second thing it does, it only focuses on the important things. So ignore all the other stuff, just focus on the important things. The third thing it does is it ignores features Bit similar to the first one, I suppose, which have it's, it kind of go, this kind of goes further actually, which have little or no impact on the outcome. You, you know, uh, for instance, what you may find is that there's some characteristic of a person or an object that you think, oh yeah, but that's that, you know, that's that's quite important in this context. But you implement that, and you and, and actually, it, it doesn't have that much impact. It doesn't have so much effect. So ignore it, forget it, get rid of it, just ignore it. Um, so it's, it's a little bit further than the hard and necessary details. Those, those tend to be things that aren't relevant at all. What it does, and this again is crucial, which is why you need to do this before you start. Really, it reduces design complexity. So if I trying to design something, I was like, oh my gosh, I've designed a computer program to predict the weather. Right, whoa, first thing you do is say, right, what's not important here? Um, reduce design uh, complexity. What's not important? Uh, the, the, you know, the, the beating of a butterfly's wings, uh, <laughs> that, old, um, that old adage is, is not important globally. You know, so just ignore it, don't try and implement it. The waving of the hair of, of the person stood next to you. And as we've just seen, it can help to generalise solutions as well. Once you start to, once you start to strip away the, the 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 outer layers, you'll find common cores occurring that you've maybe seen before. It helps to generalise solutions as well. I think that's a massively, massively vital aspect. And hopefully, you know, I mean, let's. <laughs> if it doesn't, something's gone wrong. It makes problems easier to solve. If it doesn't do that makes a problem easier to solve. It doesn't do that, arguably, why are you doing it? Um, it should make it easier to solve. Now, 
what I've not really done in this video is give you a lot of practical examples of abstraction, but you've just got to have it in mind when you're um, thinking about software design or any system, any system, not just software design, anything, a, a drawing, um, some artwork, whatever you've done. Just keep this in mind.